So, thank you. It's uh, really a privilege to be here at such a, a great meeting with so many people thinking deeply about the same problems. And what I want to tell you about is some of our work on related problems looking at tumor evolution, so tumor phylogenetics, in particular with regard to copy number variations. So I suppose it doesn't need to be said anymore at this point that cancer is an evolutionary phenomenon. And this insight that understanding cancer is fundamentally about understanding and reconstructing evolutionary systems led uh, 20 years ago to a body of work uh, offering the crucial insight that if reconstructing cancer is about reconstructing evolution, then we can take advantage of the enormous machinery of phylogenetics that computational biologists have put together over the years for understanding evolution evolutionary systems. So that led originally to a body of work by the authors shown here. And I actually wanted to pause to offer a really interesting and exciting anecdote that was told to me just a few days ago by Alejandro Schaefer, who is one of the authors of this original work, as well as one of my collaborators today. So Alejandro, when I told him I was coming to this meeting, told me that by an incredible coincidence, exactly 20 years ago this week, the field of tumor phylogenetics was born right here at Berkeley. It came out of a meeting between Alejandro and Christos Papadimitriou. So it's really especially a privilege to be back here at the birthplace of tumor phylogenetics on its 20th anniversary to talk about it. But the original conception of tumor phylogenetics, what's known as oncogenetics, was the idea that we could represent uh, tumor evolution by treating tumors as if they were species. And by building evolutionary trees among these species, discover meaningful groupings among tumors, as well as identify key decision points in the development of different subtypes of tumors. In the 20 years since this was first proposed, this has, of course, become an enormous area of study, bringing in many researchers from many different uh, areas, looking at a variety of directions related to this. A lot of the work has since shifted from these models of looking at many tumors in a single evolutionary tree to trying to understand evolution in single patients. And a lot of that work it falls more or less into the category of regional phylogenetics. And we've seen many examples of this, where you look at different tumor sites or regions within an individual, so uh, regional sections of single tumors or multiple tumors in a patient, and try to reconstruct evolutionary trees, as in this example here. My own lab had introduced a third approach to tumor phylogenetics, which is phylogenetics of single tumor cell populations. So populations of single tumor cells isolated from individual biopsies, and trying to build evolutionary trees on those cell populations. And all of these directions have led to a great deal of additional work since they were first proposed. But I want to tell you a bit about some of the directions we've been looking at, at single cell uh, phylogenetics, in particular looking at single cell phylogenetics from copy number variations. So we've been looking at this using uh, uh, what now has become an atypical kind of data for this work, fluorescence and C2 hybridization, or FISH. Most of the work going on in this area today is using some variant of single cell sequencing. But I'd like to argue that FISH actually gives you a really important window into this phenomena that no other technology available to us can uh, give us at, this, at present. So for anyone not familiar with FISH, FISH is basically just a way of fluorescently labeling small pieces of genome. And by counting copy numbers, FISH probes, we can track events of gain or loss of these genomic regions in tumors as they evolve. And this is a really key kind of marker for tumor development because most tumors have some kind of chromosome instability phenotype that leads to a very rapid gain or loss of genomic regions, a lot of structural variation. And indeed, the structural variation manifesting as copy number changes is the primary way that tumors progress. Because of this, being able to monitor this tumor progression process gives you a lot of power for understanding how these tumors are evolving. So FISH has some significant disadvantages and some significant advantages relative to other approaches. And the main disadvantage is that you get to see very little per cell. The state of the art is about 10 to 15 FISH probes per cell. So you're monitoring copy numbers of a small number of genes in a single cell. The main advantage is scalability. FISH is much cheaper and easier than sequencing technologies, so it's possible to get hundreds to thousands of cells in single tumors and to do this on scales of tens to hundreds of tumors. So you can get a kind of data that is very limited in some ways, very powerful in others. And I hope to convince you that this is a really crucial window in tumor development. So when we first started doing this, it was based on relatively early FISH data sets where we were able to see just two probes per cell. 
And it turns out that even two probes per cell is enough to reveal what have since become some of the, the major observations of tumor heterogeneity in phylogenetic studies. In particular, that tumors are far from homogeneous masses. Even with just two probes, you begin to see different populations of tumors, for example, in this histogram of copy numbers of two different probes on cell populations extracted from a single tumor. And that suggested that we could look at these populations and try to build evolutionary trees, modeling how these different populations could have arisen from an initial diploid cell. For a simple set of data like this, this is something where you could almost do this by hand if you have little knowledge of the mechanisms of copy number variation. And you can do this in populations and start to put together models of kind of consensus networks of the major pathways of evolution across tumors. And even from these early data sets, we could start to reconstruct some of these differences of mechanisms of evolution among different tumors and how these differ tumor to tumor and sometimes even cell lineage to cell lineage in single tumors. The data has since gotten much better, and that's a, both a blessing and a curse if you're a computational biologist. This is an illustration of a more recent data set where we have now eight probes per tumor. So each of the rows here corresponds to one gene that's profiled in this 2012 data set from our collaborators. Green means gain, red means loss, blue means it's uh, diploid, and each column corresponds to a single cell. So this is about 200 uh, single cells in the top diagram here, about 110 in the bottom diagram. And the key points I want to illustrate with this are, first of all, you get a very heterogeneous picture. We can kind of see that there's more or less one dominant clone here, but that's only about a third of the tumor. About another third is other reasonably well-represented clones, and about another third just looks like random noise, almost as if the tumor were trying everything. And that's a pretty typical profile for these tumors. So this, in particular, is one example of a ductal carcinoma in situ, so an early precancerous stage of breast cancer. And here we see a similar profile from an invasive ductal carcinoma, a more advanced stage. And one of the key points that these reveal to us is that if you want to understand tumor evolution, you need to be able to do your phylogenetics for fairly large numbers of cells. There's a lot of complexity there, and you can't characterize it with just even a few major clonal populations. The other important point that we observe when we look at these is illustrated by comparing these. Because one thing I haven't added here is that these actually came from the same patient. This is a DCIS and an IDC taken from a single breast cancer patient. And again, we see a fairly typical profile that the complexity we see here is quite different from what we see in the later stage. The major clone here is actually a minor clone in the later stage. What's the most dominant clone in the later stage is something we don't see at all here, although it may have evolved from the, uh, the original major clone. And when you look across populations of tumors, what you see is that almost any combination of relationships between early and late will be found in some tumors. Sometimes the major clone early remains the major clone late. Sometimes a minor clone early expands to become the major clone late. Sometimes what dominates the late tumor seems to come from nowhere, probably this noise region and something we're not even seeing. And you see all of these variations when you start looking at different patients. So what all of that is suggesting is that if we want to understand tumor evolution, we need to be able to do phylogenetics of relatively complicated data sets. We can't ignore the minor noise. We really need to take advantage of and embrace this complexity. So to do this, we wanted to try to get into some ways of building phylogenies on these more complicated data sets. And as you would often do when you're a theorist, the way you try to get started is you try to take a step back from the biology, see if you can come up with a relatively simple model you can get a handle on theoretically, see what you can do with that, and then start improving that. And what I want to do for most of this talk is kind of walk you through some stages of that and the things we learn as we go through it. As a first pass to this, we decided to propose a very simple model of copy number evolution and pretend that copy numbers change by gain or loss of isolated probes. So one probe of one gene on one chromosome gets gained or lost. We know that's an oversimplification, but it's a starting point, and it lets us pose a simple computational problem. We can model each cell we observe as a point on a grid where each coordinate corresponds to copy number of one probe. And then the problem of building most plausible phylogenetic trees is simply the problem of filling in unobserved cell types to link things together with as few mutations as possible, a few of these mutational events. And once we do that, we then have a model. And as is typical with theory work, 
we can then start to ask, does this remind us of anything we already know how to think about? And for anyone who uh, knows their phylogenetics, you would probably recognize that this is a specialized version of phylogenetics. It's actually a very well-studied problem called the rectilinear minimum Steiner tree problem. And there's more than 50 years of theory on solving rectilinear minimum Steiner tree problems. Now, the reason for this isn't because people were working on tumor phylogenetics 50 years ago. It's because people were working on integrated circuit design 50 years ago. And that's kind of the beauty of uh, theory, that when you step back to the right level of abstraction, often you can recognize that even though no one has worked on your real world problem before, they might have worked on your abstraction of it before. So that gave us a lot of tools we could use to make this problem at least tractable in practice, throw in some other heuristics from the phylogenetics literature, and come up with ways of building phylogenetic trees on relatively complicated data sets of a few hundred cells per tumor, such as in this primary tumor and this metastasis from a set of cervical cancer cases. I know you can't see what's going on in the individual boxes, but if you blow up a few, each of these corresponds to one cell type, so one vector of copy number values, essentially. We can also work with some of these more complex data sets. So these are the eight probe breast cancer data sets. And here you start getting enough complexity that you can almost feel you can tell stories about the evolution of these tumors. You kind of see an initial cell. You get some diversification, expansion into a, a more diverse population, passes through some kind of selective bottleneck, which leads to a huge explosion in diversity. And then maybe there's another of these selective bottlenecks coming up later. See a similar picture, apparently in this IDC case and other kinds of tumors, we can sort of tell similar stories. This is showing a couple of uh, prostate cancers where we've got a non-progressor, so one that didn't go on to metastasize, and a progressor. And again, we can sort of tell a story of how here we kind of see a diversification that never really goes anywhere, generates lots of diversity. Here in the progressor, we see that diversification leading to uh, eventually drilling deeper on some aspect of the phylogeny. And we can think that maybe we're seeing something that's telling us about how it is that this became a progressor while this one didn't. But I'd actually like to caution that that kind of storytelling, I think, is not a particularly good way to do tumor phylogenetics. And indeed, when you look at patient populations and you look at the different phylogenies, any of these trends you think you see, any of these stories you think you can tell on one tumor, you look at the next tumor and it's completely different. So really, if you want to get this to work, what you have to do is not just build a few phylogenies and start telling stories. You need to start asking, what can we actually find among these phylogenies, among populations of patients that is in some sense statistically robust? Some of this you can try to do more or less doing phylogeny-assisted ways of our kind of classic studies of uh, selection, uh, trying to identify drivers and passengers. In fish, you only have drivers because you only get a few probes. And despite um, many attempts by me, we have not convinced our collaborators to put on probes that aren't known to be important to cancer. So we only get driver probes to work with. And we can at least see which of these are oncogenes, which are tumor suppressors, which ones are selectively acting at particular stages of mutation. So are there some that are selectively active in metastasis versus primary tumors or in late stages versus precancerous stages? But really what I think is more interesting about these phylogenies is what we can learn about the overall evolutionary process. So you might have noticed when I was trying to tell those stories that I could try to tell stories about the overall evolutionary dynamics of a tumor even when we were zoomed out so much that you couldn't actually see the individual genes. And that's something that comes up very often in these phylogenies. Many genes will support the same story about the evolution of a tumor. And we can at least reason that you should be able to see overall effects, things like the balance of diversification and selection, selective bottlenecks, and so forth, from overall topological features of these trees rather than these gene-centric kind of focuses. And that turns out to be more than just a, a mechanism of storytelling. You can actually extract robust statistics of these trees that distinguish di uh, different tumors or tumor stages. So, for example, in the cervical cancers, this is showing a way of plotting 
a topological feature of the tree, something that captures whether we're looking at a broad tree, a narrow tree, a shallow tree, a deep tree. What it is essentially is asking what fraction of cells fall at each depth in a given tree. And this turns out to be, across multiple tumor types, a robust distinguishing feature between primary and metastatic tumors. The primaries primarily get broad and stay broad. The metastatic tumors broaden and then narrow, which uh, we can kind of say after the fact, we think, probably is reflecting stronger selection on a metastasis relative to a primary tumor, although that is just a, a hypothesis. We can't really prove that. But whether or not we can prove that, we can use these kinds of observations to make robust predictions about tumor progression processes. And that, I think, is a lot of the real power of these tumor phylogenetic methods. We can use those kinds of topological features as a way of clustering tumors and show that clustering tumors on these topologies allow statistically robust separations of long-surviving versus short-surviving tumors. So this is an example from head and neck cancers where we can show that you can separate tumors into two subgroups with a statistically significant survival difference. And more than that, you can show that this is providing independent information beyond what's already available to the clinician. So there's still a weakly significant effect, even after you account for tumor staging and smoking behavior, what the clinician would usually be using to try to make a prognosis on these kinds of patients. So the evolutionary process is encoding predictive information about the progression of the tumor. There are other ways of showing that, and we've sought to develop a, a body of work on using some basic kinds of machine learning methods to show how you can take this phylogenetic information and determine predictive features of tumors through a kind of classification paradigm. So in other words, we can ask what it is that's different between the phylogeny of a primary tumor and a metastasis. So this is showing a set of classification experiments using support vector machines to ask that question. And the key point here is that a set of features extracted from these phylogenies, basically properties of the evolutionary tree, have stronger predictive power for distinguishing a primary tumor from a metastasis than do the raw uh, experimental data or more modern kind of measures of overall heterogeneity that have been previously shown by others to be predictive of progression. The, a good model of the evolution gives you more power than heterogeneity alone and certainly more power than the experimental data. Even more exciting, you can actually robustly classify just from looking at the primary whether you're looking at a primary that progressed or a primary that did not progress. And this is something we can only do with the phylogenetic data. These other data sets, do, uh, other data sources without the phylogeny model do no better than chance. The phylogenetic models give us robust predictions of about 80%. And as we'll see later, you, you can't get that to 100%, but you can boost it a little more as we go further in this process. But essentially what this is showing us is that even a relatively simple model of the tumor evolution process can give us good enough phylogenies, close enough to some biological ground truth that they have predictive power for future progression. Now, of course, that is a very crude model, and that's just the beginning of a long process of trying to bring that ever closer to the actual biology. And one of the next steps, which uh, is reflected in, uh, I think, many of the other talks here, is to try to get that closer to the actual combination of mechanisms by which copy numbers evolve. So we don't just have single probes or single localized regions getting gained or lost. We have a multi-scale multi process in which you can have changes at the level of whole chromosomes or large pieces of chromosomes, whole genomes. And if you don't account for all of this, you're not going to get an accurate model of how the tumor is evolving. So our next step was to try to ask, can we take that first pass and then bring this towards a more realistic model, the actual multi-scale uh, uh, nature of tumor evolution. And I felt it would be remiss to come to the uh, Simons Institute for Theoretical Computer Science and not at least say that an enormous amount of theory goes into this. Actually, the bulk of what we do in this study is theory, even though I'm talking about all of these results here. But I do want to at least give a flavor of it. So there is indeed lots of lemmas and more lemmas and more lemmas and theorems and algorithms and more algorithms and more theorems and more theorems. That's what we actually do to get here. But at the end, what it does is give us a way of dealing 
dealing with these multi-scale processes so we can refine our phylogenies, take what we would get with these earlier, just rectilinear Steiner tree models, and correct them to some degree. So show that some cases where it looked like maybe there was a long chain of single probe changes is more parsimoniously explained by, let's say, an aneuploidy event, a whole genome duplication. And we can, therefore, get better trees. It turns out this doesn't actually dramatically change the topology of the trees in general. The shape statistics aren't dramatically different. But it does give you a little boost in predictive power for some of these tasks. So you're better able to dis distinguish primary from metastatic tumors. Seems that being able to detect these aneuploidy events gives you at least a little boost. It's a hint about whether you're looking at a primary or metastatic tumor. Although it doesn't help us in this cr crucial question of distinguishing a progressor primary from a non-progressor. But that is just one further step. Getting a slightly better model gives us slightly more predictive power. We decided to go back to the drawing board again and then say, not only do we have these different scales of events, but we also really should have different rates of events. Different genes are under different selective pressures, some positive, some negative, some strong, some weak. You may have different preferences for gain or loss at different scales within the genome. And these are going to be patient-specific. Different individuals will have different preferences for these kinds of mutational processes, both how they generate diversity in the tumor and how the selection occurs in the tumor. So as a next step, we went back to the drawing board, developed a whole new body of theory that let us work with uh, models of evolution with these different rates. I'm not telling you about all the algorithms that go into that. But basically, we're able to build phylogenetic trees that can take advantage of these evolutionary models, come up with other uh, kind of expectation maximization approaches to learn the evolutionary models on a patient-specific basis, concurrent with learning the trees, and come up with models that allow us to now infer these patient-specific evolutionary pressures and even better trees that are consistent with these. So we can start looking through different tumor types through these populations and asking, what are these evolutionary pressures that we learn? How do they differ between different stages of tumor development? And start seeing interesting differences, how these selective uh, environments environment or how the selective pressures are changing as we move through tumor stages as well as how this differs patient to patient across our samples and see this through for multiple different examples of these kinds of paired tumors. That actually leads to more dramatic, uh, more dramatic changes in tree topology than the move to the multi-scale model, which might seem like a bigger change in the model. So allowing these weighting events, basically taking account of the different rates, leads to some uh, greater shifts in the topologies of the tumors. And that actually leads to a more significant boost in predictive power. So we're able to get better separation of long versus short survival. So these are the tongue cancers again. And we're able to get better classification and prediction power and all of these different tasks. And it turns out that really the strongest predictors across these different tasks tend to be these overall measures of the evolutionary process. The tree topology features are actually the parameter values we learn themselves are independently a very strong predictor for some of these tasks, like distinguishing a primary from a metastatic tumor. So what all of that does is bring us to the point where we have been able to develop tumor phylogeny as in quite a lot of tumors, and I think draw some interesting conclusions that at least I think are reflective of a lot of the conclusions and a lot of the results that I've been hearing over the course of this meeting. So because we're heading into a discussion session, because we've had so much exciting uh, discussion already on the question of tumor evolution, I had made some last minute changes to my talk just a, a, a little while ago. And I decided to throw out my standard uh, sort of diplomatic, understated scientific conclusions and try to take the speaker's prerogative as the, uh, the first person to get to weigh in on our evolution discussion by giving you instead my hyperbolic overstated conclusions conclusions. <laughs> so the first thing I wanted to say is that one of the big things we can conclude from all of these tumor phylogeny studies we've been doing over the years is that there has been a ton of work in tumor phylogenetics, and most of it is useless. And the reason it's useless is that because... What's wrong and what's useless if you're going to be overstated <laughs> and hyperbolic? Oh, I'm, I'm getting there. 
discussion. Yeah, we're just like uh, sort of discussion. throwing some paint, but not showing, hitting anyone with well, it. I, yeah, well, I'm explaining that. So the reason, the reason most of what's out there is useless is because it's using the wrong models, the wrong algorithms, and the wrong data. And the reason I'm saying that is because although the overall high-level idea that we can understand tumor evolution by using phylogenetic tools, that is a fantastic idea and a very powerful idea. You have to take account of the fact that although cancers evolve, they do not evolve by the same mechanisms as species or, or individuals in a population. And if you don't take account of those mechanisms, for example, the dominance of structural variations and copy number variations, you're not going to get a useful model of most of what's happening in tumor evolution. You not only need the right models, you need algorithms suited to these models. And for the right models of tumor evolution, your standard phylogenetic algorithms do not work. You can't make the kinds of assumptions you would make when you're looking at a slow varying point mutation process. You need to develop a new body of algorithms, and I can certainly say I, I'm very happy to be in a room here with a very large fraction of the people working on developing the body of theory needed to do this. I think we all know that some of us have made a beginning towards this, but there's an enormous amount of work to do, and it needs to be done. And I will say that if you don't understand that, you're not going to gather the right data. And I would say one of the biggest challenges for the field today is that the great majority of the people who joined the field and are working on it don't understand these points at all. They have no idea why any of these things would be important, and they certainly have no idea what to do about any of them if they do realize they're important. So that's one of the reasons I think this community is so important. There's a lot of work to be done, and we are the ones who are going to do it. And I hope someone is going to see this video and decide to join in on that process with us. The second thing I will say is that we learned from looking at these tumor phylogenies, when you can look at copy number variation, you can look at these single cells, that to an overwhelming degree, tumor evolution is random noise. Most of what you are seeing is random variation. I think this is echoing a, a point Christina was making. Most of what you see is basically uh, just random diversification within the tumor. And when you have this random noise, you can't learn anything from looking at one tumor phylogeny. I think the field needs to get away away from this notion that you can build a few tumor phylogenies and start doing your storytelling about them, you're really not doing science unless you're figuring out what is statistically robust across these. It's like looking at clouds, you're going to see patterns, and most of those patterns are not going to be reproducible if you're not doing this uh, right as you go through the process. The final thing I want to say that I think comes out of our studies and I, that I think is relevant to quite a few of the questions coming up is that I would say, and I'm not the first to say this by any means, that the focus on cancers as being primarily a disease of proliferation or tumor formation, I think is a distraction if you're talking about tumor evolution. The defining feature of cancers is hypermutability. And I know there are exceptions to this, but I would say there are the exceptions that prove the rule. There are a small number of cancers that are more or less triggered by a single mutation or a small number that trigger a proliferation phenotype without a hypermutability phenotype, and those are the low-hanging fruit of cancer. Those are going to be cured by targeted therapeutics, and that's certainly important work, but for the bulk of tumors, a hypermutability phenotype, very often a chromosome uh, instability phenotype, is the defining feature of the cancer. And everything else that happens, including tumor formation, amplification of driver genes, or loss of uh, uh, driver genes, all of that are incidental side effects of hypermutability. And if you don't understand the hypermutability, then you're not going to understand how tumor evolution works or how to treat cancers uh, in the presence of these, these kinds of hypermutability phenotypes. So a lot of what we're seeing is that that mutability phenotype, what Loeb called the mutator phenotype, is itself a powerful predictor of future tumor progression. Fish is giving us one window into that phenomenon, a very incomplete one. And I know others who are working in this field are seeing the same thing from other sorts of windows. I think it's a really crucial thing to bear in mind when we're talking about tumor evolution. So I will just wrap up with some acknowledgments. This approach to single-cell tumor sequencing originally came out of uh, collaboration with my longtime collaborator, Dr. Stanley Shackney. It was originally put in place by a former student, Gregory Pennington. 
The bulk of what I was telling you about today came from work of a more recent student uh, graduate from my lab, Salim Chowdhury, and was done in collaboration with Alejandro Schaefer and Mike Gertz at the NCBI, and Thomas Reed, Kirsten hesselmeyer Hada, and Daryl Luyawangsa of the NCI. So thanks to our f funders for various aspects of this over the years, and I thank all of you for uh, your attention. Just uh, not to ask question or to comment about the one before last slide. Yeah, we'll save that for the discussion. So we will save this for the discussion, but about anything else, Lior? Yeah, I just had a question about the rectilinear Steiner tree. That's a hard problem, actually, right? So how did you, can you say a few words about how you actually do it? Uh, yes, yeah, so it is an intractable problem, so we, we can't provably solve it to optimality, and that's where these heuristics from phylogenetics come in. Uh, essentially, what the prior theory gives us is a, character, a characterization of possible Steiner nodes in optimal trees that lets you greatly cut down the space of Steiner nodes. And then we use that with more or less a version of neighbor joining, where we use that cutting down of the space to restrict, uh, or not neighbor joining, uh, median joining, where we cut down the space of possible median and basically make it tractable not to search that necessarily exhaustively, but to search medians exhaustively. And we can find empirically on simulated data that almost always gets you an optimal solution, sometimes just suboptimal. I have a question about um, how many characters you can actually have. So how many probes could you have simultaneously? Are you asking about the experimental yeah, technology yeah, or the yeah, algorithm? Yeah, well, I'm probably not the best person to answer that. Our, our collaborators in the Reed lab tell us there is no upper limit. Essentially, they can put a bunch of probes onto the cell, wash them off, put on new probes, and find the same cell. I, I assume there actually is a practical upper limit before that breaks down, but uh, they haven't told us what that is. Uh, in, in, in the real data sets we have uh, available to us, I think the largest we have is, uh, at this point, 14 probes. And how large are the regions that you look at for, for a probe? Is it, so what, what's the level? Can they actually also look at point mutations, or is it? Uh, no, I, I don't think fish could see yeah. point mutations. Again, I'm not the expert on that, so I'm not the person to ask. Well, question. Question, Trey. Oh, Trey. So um, your last comment about um, how, how half or about half of cancers have this hypermutator phenotype. Um, and you made the statement that that sort of is a cause of, of the later tumor genesis. Um, is that actually known, or is it possible it's also a consequence uh, of earlier events? For, for instance, one thing, we, this is just anecdotal, and, and I don't know the literature as well as, as, as you might or others in the room might, but we had, in, 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 in some of others' data that were ordering events in cancer, we had thought that T53 must be early because, in fact, if you look at the hypermutator phenotype of the these, you know, caught a number of variations, really they're almost co completely coincidental with loss of P53 activity, as, as, as you may know. So they're, in a sense, a marker of P53 activity, pretty much. Very, you know, complicated marker. Uh, and, and so the, the, the assumption had been, for us, that P53 must be an early alteration event in tumors that all, uh, and in fact, it, it, it's, uh, as far as we can see, the jury is still out on that. So was wondering if there's any evidence that actually, you know, are, are these copy number variations causal for anything most of the time, or are they just a random consequence of, of a cell that's already tumorigenic? Uh, well, and let me first say that that is definitely not a proven point. So that, that is part of the overstated part of my overstated conclusions. I, I'd say it's a controversial point in the, the literature. Uh, uh, do you want to? Uh, yeah. In, again, same game, um, TP53, uh, again, it's not, I'm, I'm going to present it tomorrow, it's not approved, but I have the, the result which I have are consistent with the other way around. Exactly. That, that, no, no, that, that way, as you say, that this first is the mutagenesis and then we have TP53. So, uh, again, this is a statistical argument not uh, called in action, <laughs> but, but it's uh, for a subset of breast cancer, not the subset, but, but uh, um, uh, um, endometrial cancer, we can see that upper back is before P53. Yes, well, probably it depends on cancer. It, it depends on the cancer. There are, there are, you know, the, the Vogelstein model has P53 very late. Uh, 
we've looked in squamous cell carcinoma of the skin, and with our with our timing algorithms, we get we're pretty dip compelling evidence that p53 is amongst the earliest five percent of lesions. So it, it, it is almost certainly tumor dependent um, yeah. for p53, and, and the mutator phenotype. Yeah, it, I mean, sir. It differs by cancer, and also the source of the mutator phenotype differs. So, uh, you know, p53 is the most common one, but it's not the only one. And uh, yeah, I, I'll leave that for the discussion Sorry, period. Uh, in, in the machine learning approach, when you associate it to the clinical outcomes and progression and so on, did you look at these predictors individually? Because they will not be independent, I assume they are very highly correlated, probably. So, did you assess this sort of in a multivariate setting somehow? Uh, yeah, so we did some experiments with feature selection to see if there were subsets of these features that were more strongly predictive. I don't think I have the results on these slides. So, there are some subsets that are a little more strongly predictive than the full feature set. But basically, uh, I, I guess the way I would summarize is that the number of probes we're looking at and therefore the number of features is not large enough to conclude too much from any one feature, although you, you can pick out like some of the genes are more individually predictive of, let's say, primary versus metastasis. There are some genes that are amplified selectively in metastasis and that are themselves strong predictors. Okay. Thanks, Russell.